Bobby Bizup went missing from St. Milo Catholic Summer Camp in August of 1958. His parents did not think that Bobby had run off. They thought he got lost on his way back from a fishing trip because that was the most frequently told story about Bobby's disappearance, but by no means the only one. So what really happened at St. Malo on August 15th, 1958? Bobby Bizup was born to Air Force Master Sergeant Joseph and his wife, Constance Bizup, on July 4th, 1948, and he was their only child. Bobby was deaf and he communicated through sign language and lip reading, but that didn't stop him from having a good time. He'd gone to St. Mallow three times the previous year and was back that year for more fun at the Mountain Getaway. St. Mallow was run by Reverend Richard Heaster, and it was heavily promoted in Catholic publications of the time. Thousands of young boys learned wilderness skills, went fishing, and worshipped at the Catholic campground. Seminarians, young men training for the priesthood, served as camp counselors. Many have fond memories of the place, and Bobby Bizup's disappearance is something many former campers probably have never heard of. After Bobby went missing, a wide-scale search took place. Civil Air Patrol, bloodhounds, divers, and camp counselors helped look for Bobby. About a week after the search began, Father Heaster was quoted in the Daily Sentinel newspaper as saying, We hope that if we drop the search for a couple days, the boy will come out of hiding if he's in the area. There had been several unconfirmed sightings that probably were another boy in the area that resembled Bobby. Eventually, a man would come out and say, my son looks a lot like Bobby, but he is not Bobby. So it's possible that people were spotting this other boy and they thought it was Bobby just running away and hiding. This likely hindered the search because the sightings steered the search in the wrong direction. The idea was that at this point, Bobby was scared to come out of hiding because he'd wandered off and thought he'd be in trouble. So they scaled back the search at that point. A few smaller groups continued to look for Bobby for the next week or so, but eventually the search was called off and Bobby was thought to have perished in the elements. With that said, his father continued to go to the mountains and look for Bobby whenever he could. He never gave up on his son. The stories about what Bobby was doing before he disappeared varied. One story is that Bobby went fishing with a group of boys, and when it was time to go, the camp counselor tapped his watch, letting Bobby know that they were returning to camp. Bobby followed them for a while, but got lost on the way back or wandered off. Another story is that Bobby told a few other boys that he was going fishing, and he headed out on his own. Of course, that doesn't make sense because if the group had just gone fishing, why would Bobby head off again to go fishing? His fishing pole and can of bait were found near the river, which gives credence to the second story of Bobby going fishing alone. But the first story, the one about the group going fishing together, negates the second one. So which one is correct? Unfortunately, we probably will never know the answer to that question. Not to mention, there's also another story that no one even noticed Bobby was missing until dinner time when the counselors noticed he was not around. Fast forward to 2020, and reporters with Nine News in Denver, Colorado, start to dig through a document that revealed the history of child sex abuse in local Catholic archdiocese and diocese in the state. The names of all priests with credible allegations of sex abuse were listed and explained in the document. So, as the reporters dug through these documents, they discovered that three of the accused priests had served as seminarians at St. Mallow the year Bobby went missing. Of course, this is normal to look for perpetrators that served at the camp because since this sex abuse was widespread, they were looking to see if they could make any correlations and they stumbled upon this story. It is important to note that there was never any criminal investigation into Bobby's disappearance because it was always considered an accident. In hindsight, which we know is 2020, the conflicting stories about what Bobby was doing when he went missing probably should have been a red flag. But in the late 1950s, people thought that religious organizations and people involved with them were just good. 
As we look back on this story, we have more information and a different mindset about what could have been going on. The camp counselors that were at St. Mallow in 1958 would go on to receive credible charges of sex abuse. Those men are Harold Robert White, Jerry Rapola, and Neil Hewitt. All three would eventually leave the priesthood either through defrocking, which means they lose all their faculties as priests, or because they resigned. Jerry Rapola was, mo- was moved from assignment to assignment, spending about a year in each placement while he was in the priesthood. This is an indicator that something was wrong. There was no reason to move priests around every year. They can't get to know the people in their flock if you do that. But this was a practice that took place when priests were having trouble at a parish or an assignment. And unfortunately, a lot of times that trouble was that someone had complained that they possibly had abused them. He eventually was removed from the priesthood and told to get counseling before dying after what is described as a prolonged illness in 1971. Harold Robert White was also a seminarian that was at St. Mallow the year Bobby went missing. Now, he is believed to be one of the most prolific child molesters in Colorado history. He was defrocked in 2004 and has since passed away. A priest who has credible charges of sex abuse against children is Neil Hewitt. Hewitt is still alive, and when the Denver News crew went to interview him, he had a different story about Bobby. Hewitt claimed that he was in charge of running a candy stand at the camp, and Bobby kept coming up trying to buy candy. Hewitt says he told Bobby he couldn't have any more candy, and Bobby was so upset by this that he ran off into the woods, and that was the last anyone saw of him. Now, you may be thinking, well, it's hard to remember something that happened so long ago, and that's fair. But there are several reasons why Hewitt's story about the candy is so odd. First of all, Hewitt was there back in 1958. He was a camp counselor. He helped lead the charge to try to find Bobby. If this is what happened, instead of Bobby going off fishing or getting lost in the woods while they were headed back from fishing, why didn't Hewitt clarify back then? That would have changed maybe where they were looking for Bobby. The next year, Hewitt was back at the camp and he and a few other camp counselors were taking a group of boys up Mount Meeker and Hewitt spots pieces of Bobby's shirt. So in addition to Hewitt saying that he's pretty much the last person to see Bobby before he runs off into the woods about not being able to get candy, then we have Hewitt leading part of the search when Bobby goes missing. But then we also have Hewitt finding Bobby's body as he spotted pieces of Bobby's shirt and that's when they stopped climbing the mountain and noticed that there was a bone as well so the idea of Hewitt forgetting how these events unfolded seems unlikely it is also interesting that Hewitt helped lead the search for Bobby because if he's leading the search for Bobby and he knows maybe more than he's saying I mean isn't that ideal you kind of lead the search in a different direction. But that's just speculation, pure 100% speculation. So after the bone was found, a search party went up and found more remains, including Bobby's hearing aid, but his skull was never found. So that's curious because his hearing aid is found. Why not his skull? That is where the story takes us back to 2020. Dr. Tom McCluskey was watching the news report about Bobby Bizzup's disappearance. When he heard the part about Bobby's skull never being found, he thought about a skull he'd inherited from his father, Dr. Joseph McCluskey, after his death in 1980. The skull was in a paper bag in the basement. Dr. McCluskey was good friends with Revan Heaster, who ran St. Mallow. At the time, Bobby went missing. All the young McCluskey had been told about the skull was that it might belong to a boy who died at St. Mallow. This, of course, is is odd. When was the skull found? Why was it passed around from one person to another? And why weren't the police or Bobby's parents notified? So just a side note, while that's a little odd, these guys are doctors. And there was a time when 
sometimes people would find remains, human remains, and they would maybe give it to a doctor or something or a medical school or whatever. It is uh, more recent that we have come to the understanding that this is this is not okay, uh, probably part of a crime scene, things like that. And we ask people if they want to donate their bodies to science, things like that. But while this is strange in some manners, because of the time period when it takes place, it's not that odd that a doctor would have what is sadly um, a real human skull of possibly someone who met foul play. So moving on. One more strange twist to the story is that Robert Richard Heaster, who this is Richard Heaster, the nephew of the priest that ran St. Mallow. They have the same first name. Um, so I know it's a little confusing. <laughs> he was at camp with Bobby in 1958. Now he has yet a fourth story about the last time Bobby was around the campgrounds. He claims that the last time he saw Bobby was when the boy was rushing out of the building. He was upset. He was trying to say something, but Heaster couldn't understand him because, you know, Bobby was deaf. And so while he could say some words, he had trouble speaking. So Heaster claims that Bobby was super angry and he's running out of the building. And um, he says that's the last time he saw him. So when we fast forward to uh, the news report, the doctor luckily, uh, doesn't just sit there and say, oh, oh man, this might be this kid's skull. No, he takes it to the authorities and Bobby's body has been exhumed. Even though Bobby's parents have both passed away and Bobby was an only child, it's still important to get answers in this case. When a life is taken, even if it was decades ago, we owe it to this person's memory to do our best to find out what happened. Also, Bobby Bissett was a little boy. He deserved to grow up and have a life. Even though the crime took place in 1958, it's good to hear that the National Park Service has opened a case and is looking into his disappearance. Hopefully, the investigation will be able to secure the justice Bobby deserves.